Good evening, everyone. You're all very welcome to the second in the National Archives online public lecture series for 2021. My name is Elizabeth McAvoy, and I'm the archivist with responsibility for education and outreach in the National Archives. And on behalf of the office, we're delighted to welcome you here tonight and also to welcome our guest speaker, Sandy O'Byrne, who will present on civil registration and on how the records it generates can act as a gateway to our past. But before we begin, I'd like to go through just a few housekeeping details so that you can engage with our event. Audience cameras are off and mics are muted, but we actively encourage your participation in tonight's talk using the webinar's Q&A function. Sandy's talk will run roughly for 40 minutes with 10 minutes or so for Q&A at the end. You'll have the opportunity to submit your questions during the talk. So please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the control panel as we will not be monitoring the chat box for them. We'll accommodate as many questions as time permits. So apologies in advance if we don't get around to answering yours. We're recording this webinar and we'll make it available after the event on our dedicated YouTube channel. We'll also be live tweeting the talk, so please do like or retweet our posts at NAR Ireland. So a few words about tonight's talk. Um, sorry, here we go. Civil registration records exist in Ireland from the mid 19th century to the present day and document major events in people's lives. These records of births, marriages and deaths look backward to previous generations and forward to the future, creating in the process a foundational source on which to build a family tree. Sandy's talk will provide an overview of Irish civil registration and explain its origins in Victorian administration as well as the information that certificates of births, marriages and deaths contain for today's researchers. She will describe some of the difficulties encountered along the way when researching records of civil registration and will examine the various ways in which these records can be accessed and read and how they can be used to provide a framework for a larger story. As for our speaker tonight, Sandy O'Byrne graduated from Trinity College Dublin with a BA in the History of Art and English, specialising in the 18th century Irish country house. She subsequently worked as a journalist and features writer, and is also an author and former part-time lecturer. Genealogy has always been a fascination for Sandy, beginning with research into her own family tree, one of which extends as far back to William the Conqueror. Now a full-time professional genealogist, Sandy undertakes family research work and consultancy for private and corporate clients. She holds a diploma in family history and is a member of Accredited Genealogists Ireland, the accrediting body for professional genealogists in Ireland. And she has been a council member for the past three years. So civil records, the gateway to the past. I will now hand over to you, Sandy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that. Uh introduction and for introducing civil records. I'm going to try to uh, put up the, tonight's presentation on screen for everybody. Um, right, there we go. Now, so the civil registration, uh, records of births, marriages and deaths, it sounds like a really um, difficult and boring topic of discussion. Actually, it's a 150 year story of lives of families and of, 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 of individual people. Um, and it also forms the framework for investigating a family, your family history. So it's, they're immensely important records. Uh, and they also tell their own particular story in, 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 in a special way. So tonight, we're going to, to look at how they can be how you can get the best out of them and how you, you can make the most uh, for your family research. Um, sorry. Well, first of all, we're going to look at how to access these records, where to find them, how to find them, and, um, and the best way to achieve that. Then we're going to, to look at the origin and, and creation of the records, the way they were 
created and the reasons for which they were created. At that stage, we look at how you identify the person you want. How, how do you know it's the right record? How do you know it's your great grandfather's birth record or a marriage record or, or, or whatever? And finally, we're going to look very briefly at reading uh, the records themselves and reading between the lines and how you extend that into the whole story uh, of your family in, in other records. So we start off with access. On site in those halcyon days when we could uh, jump on a bus or a Lewis into town and go into the art on a train if we we're going further and go in, into the, uh, the offices, into the research rooms. Civil records in Dublin are held by the General Registry Record, General Register's Office, sorry, there's a misprint on the slide, um, in Werbo Street in Dublin, an old part, lovely part of Dublin. You go in, you take the books, index books off the shelves, look for the person you want, and you get a photocopy of the record. For, that, for of their birth, um, marriage, or, or death. I, the General Register Office in Northern Ireland and the Public Record Office in Northern Ireland, are both, they're both lo located in Belfast. There you search, rather than searching through books, you search on the screen, they're digitalized, um, and in the same way you can get a printout of the record. And just to state the obvious, which is always wise to do, what you get is a record. It is in no sense a certificate. Uh, for birth or, or, or marriage or death or anything like that. It is, it's, it's a record for, 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 of, of the event for research purposes. That's on site. Hopefully we'll very soon be able to do that uh, again. Um, the um, records are accessible and, and e generally um, easy to access. Most people begin looking online. And since 2016, we've had the resource of irishgenealogy.ie, a government-sponsored uh, website which has a digitalized database of civil registration records uh, linked to images of the records themselves, which you can download or print, etc. cetera. Um, practically all of it is now a, you can, is linked to images. The deaths from uh, 1864 to 1870 haven't yet been linked, linked in, um, but everything else is available as an image of the actual record, which is, is immensely useful. It's a very useful resource. There, as with any database, there are limitations. Uh, there are some records which just don't appear for, for whatever reason. Uh, it, they, these are scanned images of the records. So somebody had to scan them in every system has its, its effects. So there are omissions, there are things that are missing from these records. Um, and um, the search engine it ha has, has, has restrictions as well. So that sometimes it may be difficult to find a particular name if there's a huge variety of ways it may be spelled, for example. Um, you would need to know the, the, the area or at least you are a, a date range in order to identify the, the, the correct record. But Irish genealogy is a very good resource. It's one we're going to come back to in a few minutes. And the indexes for Irish civil registration are also available from familysearch.org, which is the website of the Church of Latter-day Saints, uh, one of the biggest, the biggest collection of geneal genealogical records in the world. Um, they have a, 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 a digitalized um, index, which goes to 1958. It's linked to, uh, to, to record images to, a, to an extent, mainly for birth records, which go from 1864 to, to 1913, much less for, for marriage records and for, um, for death records. Use, it's a very useful resource used in conjunction with Irish genealogy. Uh, it can be very, very helpful. Then there is the subscription site rootsireland.ie, which is the website from the um, Irish Family History Foundation. It is it, its civil records are are limited to a number of counties, which have been uh, more or less fully transcribed, and these are transcriptions, so they carry all the caveats that usually go with 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 transcription records that they that can be that can be errors. Um, they cover at, at present. They cover the counties of um, Derry or London Derry, Donegal, Gal Galway, Kilkenny, Leitrim, Limerick, Mayo, Ross Common, Sligo, Tipperary, and Waterford, uh, up to about nine, 1911 or 1920, um, and partially cover the northern counties of Antrim, Armagh, Down, and Monaghan. Um, 
and um, these are based on what we're going to talk about in a few minutes. These are based on local on the local registers, so they're a slightly different source material, and in that sense, they can be useful for for uh, where you can't find a record. Uh, you they they can be a useful resource, and you can take out a short term subscription if if you're not going to to use it extensively. They have church records as well, which can be useful. Um, so now we come to the history lesson so, because it is all with every record and every type of record uh, you it is it's always useful to know how they were created by whom and for whom for what and for what purpose the records were cre created because none of the records that we search were created for genealogists it's a, another obvious fact but you know, sometimes i think they were created to frustrate genealogists but anyway but they they were created for a definite purpose all the records that we use today to research our family history um it's it's it's, it's very inappropriate in history to attribute actions to attribute um events and uh, to particular thoughts particular uh, um aspects of history and to interpret society in a very limited and 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 simplistic way, the relationship between uh, social, the development of, the, of society and the events that were going on at the time is extremely complex, and it would be not only inappropriate but improper to try to, to, to identify things as having specific causes and specific motivations. Anyway, at the beginning of the, of the 19th century, there was a, a, a mood, there was a mood of change, there was a mood of reform, um, there was, for the first time, the voice of the people was being heard after the turmoil at the end of the 18th century. There was a, a, a there was an element of change within society, um, and there was a move toward, towards a more official uh, organization of society um, and of of, of communities. Um, there was also the beginnings of a move towards towards secularism, and all these things were were in the air. And when when after the Act of Union in Ireland, in the decades following the Act of Union in 1800, there was also um, a, a, the idea of problems to be addressed. And what does a government do when it has to, when it has to take action about something? It's a, it, it forms a commission. Nothing's changed. So the Royal Commission in, was set up in 1833 to inquire into the conditions of the poorer classes in Ireland. And the result of their inquiries was the Poor Law Ireland Act of 1838, which was very similar to the Poor Law Act for England and Wales in 1834. And what it did was to establish the Poor Law Unions. These were geographic administrative areas, and they were unions in the sense that they were a union of parishes, the parish having been the administrative unit for hundreds of years since medieval times. These new units were, were unions of parishes centered around a large town, usually a market town, which was quite new at the time. This was, a, 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 this was more, a, a more urban administration. This was centering on the town rather than on, on the parish or rather than on the land. It was centered on the town. And these poor, poor, poor law unions were established from a group of parishes, civil parishes around a, a town and in that town, a workhouse was built and a, a board of guardians was established to administer the, the, the workhouse and provide what was known as indoor relief, in other words, shelter of a kind for the most destitute and for often children and, 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 and that sort of thing. Um, and the, this board of, 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 and to raise a, a, a poor rate, to raise a tax or tax, uh, for from this community to support the poorest within the community, both in the workhouse and in what they called outdoor relief to supply su supplementary income in times of hardship to and to provide for for widows, for orphans, for people while their man was injured or was ill and couldn't support his family for a period of time. Then um, the 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 poor rate and the poor, and, and and the poor law union was intended to step in and to provide this this kind of relief. Um, as time went on a little bit, the poor law unions were divided into dispensary district, districts to provide a basic kind of medical care for uh, those who couldn't afford to, to pay for a physician themselves. The, uh, as, as time, uh, and a medical officer or doctor was appointed to each dispensary district within the union. 
uh, and as, again, infirmaries were then built onto the workhouses, along with the doctor, there, would, might, there, was a, there would, might be a district nurse, midwife. The theory was all very good, that there was going to be welfare, there was going to be health care. As we know, the workhouses turned into one of the worst aspects of um, the Victorian administration. The intention and the structures that were put in place were sound and actually lasted for, for a long time. Um, then civil, when, when civil registration, the registration of births, marriages and deaths was introduced, originally it was intended to be introduced in uh, 1845, but the Roman Catholic Church in particular had grave reservations, particularly about the, 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 the state interfering. Um, they felt it would undermine the, the, the religious nature, particularly of marriage. Um, and there was a good deal of resistance. So from 1845, non-Catholic uh, marriages are registered, but not anything else. Non-Catholic meaning um, Jewish marriages, which the, the, were recognized by the, the Marriage Act of 1844, uh, and, and, and Protestant marriages um, principally. Uh, then in 1864, civil registration was introduced for all uh, for births, marriages, and deaths, and it was mandatory. You had to register such an event. And at that stage, the poor law unions doubled as superintendent registrar's districts. It's a big mouthful, but this was the, the, the superintendent in charge of collecting, um, coordinating, uh, and holding the um, records of, of marriages, of, of, of births, marriages, and deaths for his area. And the um, and the, the the dispensary districts in, within the poor law unions now within the, within the um, superintendent registrar's districts became the registration districts, the local uh, centres where where events were were registered. Usually, the local register was was the local doctor, and people would go to register the birth of a baby or or, or somebody's death to um, the local doctor who would um, uh, keep a register. Of, of, of births and deaths. Um, this was a new, uh, very importantly, this was a new administrative unit. Uh, up to then, administration had largely been through parishes. This was a new unit. It often ex exceeded the boundaries of parishes. It was superimposed on the system that was already there and the geography that was already there. Um, how it worked, people, uh, for, for, for births and deaths, people went to the local, uh, register registrar um, who who kept kept the registry books for three months or until they were filled. Then he sent it on to the superintendent registrar in the town, um, who in turn made a copy of all the um, registers that he received and sent that copy to the general register office in Dublin, and that formed the basis of the indexes, which the centralized indexes, indexes which we have and we use. Today, marriages were registered by the clergy, registered by the church. Um, in the same way, they kept a civil register alongside the parish register, and this civil register was sent on to the superintendent registrar, who again copied it and sent it uh, to Dublin along with the, with the rest of, of the records. Um, so, as you can see from the start, we had two uh, versions of, of this. Um, of these records, there was the, there were the original registers held um, initially by the by the local registrar, and then sent to the uh, superintendent registrar in the in in the center of the union, um, who copy, who sent a copy to Dublin to the general registers office while retaining the original um, registers. So. That was how the system operated. It also meant that there were stages and there, were, there was room for error at, in these stages because copying at the time, remember, was being done by hand. It was, you were reading handwriting, you were writing from one to another. So there were possibilities of things being misinterpreted. And as we look later on, we'll see the various kinds of problems which could, um, which could occur. But these records were created originally as part and for a, wealth, a welfare system, not one we might recognize terribly well today as, well, as a welfare system, but that's what it was. And they were also to develop a more 
uh, official and more recognized relationship between the citizen and, and the state, and one that had more control. Um, and the, the framework for, um, for civil registration remained in place, um, and it remained a part of um, the health system up to 2004, when it was moved from the Department of Health to the Department of Social Protection. Um, but the local registers remain in health centers. Um, so that, that relationship um, has remained. So if we, um, after all that, which was probably rather a, lot, a rather a mouthful, the responsibility for civil registration when it was introduced uh, rested largely with, with the people. It was a civic responsibility to, rent, to, to register uh, a birth or to register a death. And it was, it was mandatory and it, um, heavy, quite heavy fines were imposed for not registering um, a birth or a death in, in time. Uh, it was, notice was supposed to be given within three weeks um, and full details within three months. So that it was quite a specific task and a responsibility. Um, and in, but in spite of this, for the first perhaps two decades up to the 1880s, um, there were, especially up to the 1880s, even beyond that, uh, some, um, some births, some events were never, were not registered. Either people were reluctant or they felt unable. They just, it just didn't happen. We don't know how much, maybe as much, maybe as much as 15, somewhere between 10, 15% of um, uh, births and deaths were just not registered for, 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 for whatever reason. Just because you don't find it in a database or uh, in a search doesn't necessarily mean that it wasn't registered. It might mean a lot of other things to do with, with the search or with the resource that you're using. But we also must accept that maybe it's maybe one in 10 were just not registered. Uh, it was the, the responsibility of the clergy to register marriages and uh, a, a, a rector or a parish priest would generally keep two registers, the, the parish register alongside um, a civil register for marriages, which in the same way would be sent to the superintendent register, would be copied and sent on. Um, and it was his responsibility uh, to do that. Um, there were, and there were a number, only a certain number of people who were qualified to register such an event. N not everybody could, could, uh, could register a particular, um, whoops, what have we done? Yes. Um, in the case of a birth, it was usually a parent who registered the birth, but if a parent wasn't available, if the mother was ill, for example, or maybe the, the, the father was away, somebody who was present at the birth who might be a member of the household. Um, it might be uh, a nurse or midwife who had been present or a relative. You know, some, 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 some women went home to their mothers or to an older sister to have a baby, and they might, that might be the person who would register uh, the birth. Um, later on, and quite later on, because hospital birth in Ireland didn't really, certainly outside the cities, it didn't really become um, that popular until well into the 20th century. Uh, later hospital officials, um, a hospital almoner later and later a register would have, have, um, would have registered the birth as, it, as, as is done now. Um, for deaths, it was somebody present at the death. Usually, the, the carer, the person who was looking after somebody, if they were if they were ill, um, quite often a member of the family, and that's why it's often useful from a genealogical uh, genealogical point of view. Um, it would be a son or a daughter, a grandchild, um, a, a spouse, um, a brother or sister, whoever was present. The attending physician, if there was a, if there was a doctor looking looking after the person. Um, a member of the household, and that might be uh, it. Might be a servant in a, in in a, in a big house where somebody died, just with 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 servants in the house, um, or it, it could be the the official in a, in a workhouse, um, or someone with knowledge of the circumstances of death. That's usually where there was an inquest, where the, where it would be the coroner. Um, marriages were the clergy, and as we've said, they kept would keep two registers, and the civil register would go to the the superintendent. There was a certain amount of denominational difference. Most mem most clergy were um, accepted and um, authorized to register to register a marriage. Um, there, there were some of the minor house churches um, and smaller communities where a register a registrar might um, it, it might need to be present. There was all the, also the the um, civil registration of 1864 recognized civil marriage, so people could be married by a registrar. It was no longer 
and, and it would be legally binding. Um, and sometimes this happened in the case of uh, interchurch marriages, where it might be um, uh, they might also they might also sort of they might also marry uh, or have a, a church service at a, at another date or in another place, but th there might be a civil marriage. So um, you you do you come across that um, as well. Um, now the consequences of the way these records were created really are are, are threefold. As as we've just as we've said and as we've seen, there were the two record sets: the local. Uh, and the centralized um, records. So from the start, there are two sources. Uh, the, they created new geographic units and that had consequences because you, a, an area might be known by its parish name, by its village. Now you need, you, you, the, the civil records would be organized around the registration districts and the superintendent registrar's district. So it created a new set of geographic administrative units. Um, and it was mandatory and there was a time schedule. It was something you had to do. And this was particularly in the early years, this was something that was quite significant and it was quite a worry from, for, for, many, for many people. Um, I'm just going to show you this, which is just an interesting example. Forgive the, the where it's blocked out. It's just for obviously confidentiality reasons. Um, this is a civil, uh, on, on top, the white uh, piece of paper is a civil record um, of the birth of young James in, um, on the 10th of January, 1869. That's very early in, in civil registration. It's only, only, only five years after the start. And we see his birth registered. I can tell you it was registered by his father um, for the 10th of January, 1869. But if we go to the corresponding church register, um, to the baptism reg register, we see that the same young James, and it was the same, because unfortunately I've had to blank out his parents, but it was the same person, was actually baptized on the 9th of November, 1868, which is curious because although people were conscientious and very quick about baptism, two months before the birth is something unusual um, and somewhat difficult. We don't, we don't, we can't be absolutely certain, but what the most likely explanation is that James's parents were slow to, they forgot, or they neglected to register his birth. And when his father went on the 26th of January to, to register the birth of his son, he realized that he was late. Actually, he was within the three months. So he, if, if he had given notice of the birth, it would have been all right, but apparently he hadn't. He was concerned about being fined for being late. So he gave uh, a, a, a date of birth within uh, a much shorter period of, of time and made James about two months younger than he actually was he registered the birth on the 10th of January. We can't be absolutely certain that this was the, the thought process, but it is more than likely. And one from what the other, the background that I know it, it, it is um, the most likely explanation of what happened. People were concerned, particularly in the early years about this, um, this, this very official uh, need uh, to, 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 to register and record um, the birth of a child or the death of, of somebody in the family. So when we go, um, so what, what, I, what is important from that is that you, even though these are primary sources, they are uh, official records, there are sometimes errors or there are um, misleading facts within them. So when we go to identify the record to find the record you want to find the birth of the, the great grandfather or the the um the death of grandfather whatever you have three pieces of information to help you find that um you have the, the place the date range and you have the name of the person we're just going to look at the at what's behind these this is the search page for Irish genealogy, which is probably where a lot of people will start to look for these records. Um, you, you, you're, you give a name and then you the civil registration district. And this is what you need. It's, it's no good putting down the county or putting down the name that you know was the place the person came from. It, it, you need the civil, civil registration district. If you don't know it, it's better to leave it out. Uh, and you need a, date, a, a, a year range or a date range for the event. You can manipulate the search, you can browse it by district and office, you can use just a surname within a confined 
number of years. Sometimes that will help, particularly if it's not a particularly common surname. Um, uh, you, you, can, um, you, you may have to search by a variety of versions of the name. Um, but what you do is you put in the information you have, much as you narrow it down as much as you can, particularly if it's a, if it's a popular name, uh, and you'll be given a list of uh, the people born who meet that, uh, that criterion, and you then go to the linked images, in most cases, to identify the person you want. Um, so let's look at this information for a moment. Um, the superintendent registrar's district. Now, there, the first thing and the most important thing, you, you, if you, you know the place that, you're, that your, your relative, your ancestor came from by a, you know it by a particular name. You need to de decide and to find out exactly what that place is. You, know, it, it, you need to define the location. Is it a village? Is it a townland? Is it a parish? Is it an, elect an electoral division, which was a further subset of, of the Bulo unions for, for census and electoral purposes? Um, and that is maybe a, a, a location you'll know if you found them in a census. You need um, to, but you need to know from the start what it is, um, townland, village, etc. cetera. Um, then on johngrain.com, Irish Ancestors has an interactive map um, of the superintendent registrar's districts, which will help you to define places within them. George Handwin's book, Town Laws, Townlands in Poor Law Unions, also has a list of um, the townlands in each union, breaking them down also into, par into civil parishes and um, uh, in, into electoral um, uh, divisions, which are is useful to identify the, the 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 superintendent registrar's district that you need. But it is very important because some uh, SRDs or super um, cross boundaries of counties. For example, the poor law union, the superintendent registrar's district of Limerick, actually crosses into count into County Clare. And it includes a number of, of County Clare parishes. So if you know if you know that your family came from County Clare, you need you uh, if they if they came from a certain part of County Clare, you might have to look in the Limerick uh, Union or the the Limerick SRD to find them. Um, the same thing is true. You can you can know that your family came from say a place like Moylock in County Galway. And uh, Moylock is a village, it's a townland, it's a civil parish, and it's also a Roman Catholic parish. And do remember that civil parishes and Roman Catholic parishes are usually different in the area that they cover. Um, a village you, 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 is, is different to, to obviously to a townland, and all these places may be near each other, but they're slightly different, so that you, you, you need to, um, to identify the kind of place, the, the, to define the location, to know what kind of place. Uh, it is that, that the name refers, um, and then you can locate the, the superintendent registrar's district. Um, where did these events happen? For births, they were usually at home. Um, hospital birth was a 20th century uh, invention, um, and it applied first, although we have the oldest um, lying in, the oldest maternity hospital in what was then called the British Isles, um, or in these islands, um, it, uh, it we, home birth was was the norm in in Ireland, except perhaps in the cities uh, up to to well into the twentieth twentieth um, century. Um, sometimes girls or women went home; they went home to their mother, to a sister, to have a baby. So you need maybe to look if you're looking for the registration uh, of, of the birth. You might have to look in 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 that area and later then in hospitals. Um, deaths were usually again at home. Um, but not necessarily in the family home. And older people often moved out of their farm, which was handed on to a son, um, and they might move into a house in town or in the village. Um, later in life, um, uh, particularly uh, if, if uh, uh, they were a widow or widower, they might go to live with a son and daughter, and that could be some, some distance away, uh, where particularly the daughter might be living in quite some distance away from what had been her home. Uh, so that you'll need to, to identify that area, to identify the right uh, uh, superintendent registrar's district. Uh, there were deaths in, in, the, in the workhouse um, and, and, and or the infirmary and later in the county homes. Um, if you can't find uh, a, a death, 
and it, can, it comes within the, uh, the period of one of the major conflicts. It's quite an awful lot of Irish people fought in both wars, and it's quite likely that they were killed uh, in uh, killed outside Ireland, killed abroad. You won't find their death obviously registered on the, in the Irish records, and you may have to look in the, among the casualties of, of, of the first war or, or the second war. And it's something to bear in mind if a death, you can't find a death and it, it kept, coincides with, with, with one of those conflicts, or in fact earlier as, as there was a great tradition of Irish people serving in, in the army. Um, marriages usually happened in the girls' parish. Um, so you that and that can be tricky if you only know the family from after, from the time of their marriage. You may have to try and establish where the girl, uh, where was her home, um, and uh, it, in order to 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 narrow down where the, where they could have been married. Generally speaking, in the in nineteenth century Ireland, people married fairly close to home, but that's not 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 always true. It's a sort of um, there are too many exceptions. Uh, that break that that rule. Uh, people who were emigrating, who were leaving Ireland, would often, quite often, got married before they left, and they might marry near uh, where wherever they were departing uh, their point of departure. They, if they were going out of Queenstown Cove or um, taking the boat to Liverpool from Dublin, then they might marry uh, near near there. Um, what the other, the next. Right. The night, next piece of information you have is date, a range of dates, and this is very much pick a number. Very hard to establish dates with any great accuracy, um, particularly in the 19th century, and I'm going to have to pick up the pace because I talk too much as usual. Um, in, if you're working from a census, people generally underestimated their age, and you need to allow a good margin. If you have an age on a census which gives you a date of birth, allow at least five years either side, um, even a little bit more. Uh, if you found a, chi a child in the uh, 1911 or 1901 census, then it's more it's more likely to be accurate. Uh, if you found a, if you baptism records, they're very close to the time of birth, and records from army, from school, from colleges, some occupational records like um, apprenticeships would also give you a fairly accurate date of birth to go and look for uh, a record. Um, a marriage you can estimate from the birth of the first child. The marriage was usually within a year or two. Um, if you find a, a girl in the 1901 census, but not in the 1911, it's it's a good it's a good likelihood that that she got married and her name changed. So that can be very useful if it fell within that relatively short period of time. Um, other vital records of of, of um, marriage or death can help you work out or approximate um, a date of I'm sorry birth or death can give you an approximate date. There are other minor things like um, increased wealth. Sometimes if a man inherited if his father died or an uncle died or something then he could afford to get married. Um, second marriages often were very close to the death of the previous spouse. Um, with a man who might who just needed somebody to look after the children, a woman often needed the support and protection of a man. So they were often, we would consider quite close uh, to the death of the, of the first spouse or previous spouse. Um, death records, again, you can, the census can help to, to narrow down a date. Um, and the marriage record will indicate if a father, um, give, the marriage record gives the name of the father, as you know, um, he uh, indicates if he's alive or dead. If it says he, he has died, that's probably accurate. If it says nothing, it doesn't mean that he's still alive. It just means that it hasn't been recorded. Obviously, if you can find a will or a newspaper um, mention, it will give you a, a date. And newspapers can be extremely helpful particularly if, if, if somebody died as an accident, died in war, died. Uh, they, they, newspapers didn't have a lot of international news, so a lot of local news was included, and that can be really, really helpful. One of the big problems, lack of consistency in names. The name is the most obvious piece of information you have, but there's a huge lack of um, consistency in the way that um, names were written in Ireland, particularly in the 19th and early 20th century. You know, for example, names like names like Hulohan or Holohan can be can be written with two L's, with with an A instead of an an O, with all sorts of different versions. It's not that it was it was wrong; it was just people were incredibly casual about how names were spelled. Um, the concept of a surname spelled a particular way, written a certain way, belonging to to certain people hadn't really wasn't really defined in the way we define it today. Even though surnames have been around in Ireland, they were part of, 
of Irish history. And it was, we were one of the first countries to adopt a surname as a means of identification. But that belonged really to, to, a, to an older um, time. It belonged to, to, to the clan, to, to a set of people. Um, and as society changed, the names changed along with them so that there was a great deal um, of, there's a great deal of variation in names. And it's one of the most difficult parts of genealogy. Um, a name like if you, you know, for, with immigrants, if you, if, if somebody called Walsh, who's been two or three generations in New York as John Walsh, when he goes to look at for his family back home, it might've been Brannock. So, you know, um, the, the, also the Gaelic uh, prefixes, particularly O, not so much Mac, but to some extent, uh, you don't see much before the end of the, of, of the 19th century and the Gaelic revival. Um, so there, the, again, it, there's there there is a lot uh, there's a lot of variation. Literacy accounted for part of that because although it in, increased enormously as the 19th century went on with the uh, introduction of national schools, uh, a lot of people uh, had limited uh, ability to read and write, and they. Uh, the, the, a name might be the best guess of whoever was writing it down on the record. Uh, and in the case of people who left out, and that was often uh, an immigration official who would know absolutely nothing about the spelling of an Irish name. Um, we also have the problem that, that certain names are very popular in Ireland, names like Kelly, names like Byrne, names like uh, Murphy, uh, and names tend to cluster the same name is in the same area. So it can be quite hard to sort out the right line, the right family. Um, from, the, from the practical point of view, when you're searching wildcard searches, you know, where you put in the beginning of a name and then an asterisk or a percentage mark if you're using um, a, a, some data, database, um, uh, you'll have to allow for variants and try different searches using different variants of the name. Think phonetically, say the name and think of any possible interpretations of that sound that there could be um, depending on the part of the country you're in. So that if you can't, and many, many times when you are searching for a record of a birth, marriage, death, and you can't find it, it is because of a variation or a mistake or an error in the name. Um, and this is something that is, it's just trial and error to overcome in many cases. Um, sorry, yeah. Sandy. Just to let you know, it's now 10 to 8, just giving you uh, the time there. OK, thank you. Thank you. That's great. We'll be finished. Um, just as we as we finish up, we're just going to look at the actual records themselves um, quite briefly at this stage. Uh, I've just chosen a, an arbitrary search here, um, for Jane Goggin, who I know was born around 1882. She was born in County Clare and her father was either William or Edward. Taken a name that is not, there are a fair number of Goggins, particularly in that area, but not, it's not hugely common, so that will just make it a bit, a bit more clear. Um, so what I do is I search for Jane Goggin, born between 1875 and 1885, and the result is not are nine entries. The only one of which is anywhere near to County Clare is is Limerick, um, and the, I I know, and we talked about it earlier, that there are two registration districts. Uh, that, that cross into in, into in, into County Clare. That sorry, the part that's mis, mis, miswritten. That um, the the re, the superintendent registration district, the Poor Law Union of Limerick, does cross the border into into County Clare, and there are two two districts there that that come under uh, Limerick, even though they are in fact in County Clare. So that's a possible explanation. So when we bring up the record, what we find is that um, on the 14th of December, 1879, at a place called Mount Pellier, or Mount Pellier, um, Jane Ellen uh, was born to Father William Goggin from Mount Pellier and his wife, Fanny Goggin, formerly Talbot, and that William was a farmer. He registered birth on very properly and very legally on the 22nd of December, some days after the birth of his daughter. Uh, and if we look at the heading, we see that, that it was in the SRD, the Superintendent Registrar's District of Limerick, uh, the Registrar's District of Anacati uh, in County Limerick. So it fits in with most of the information I had, 
father's name is William, and I thought it was William, or we knew it was William or Edward. Um, it's between the, it's around the date we thought, it's three years earlier than 1882, so that's fine. Um, but it is very definitely in Limerick. Now, um, if I do some geographic research, I can find out that Montpellier is a townland and a village, and it's on the borders of Limerick and Clare. In fact, it's one side of a bridge which links Limerick, which, which, where the river forms um, the boundary between the counties. And on one side, you have the village of Mount Pellier. On the other side, you have, have O'Brien's Bridge, and O'Brien's Bridge is, is linking uh, the two. So they're very close to each other. Um, and a coffee, for some reason, I associate more with Tipperary, but it is, again, it, it, it does span the, the, um, the border of the counties. Um, so I can be re I think I can be reasonably certain that this is the, the record I'm looking for. Um, and, it, and as such, it gives me quite a, a, quite a good deal of information. I'm going to need to, to maybe do a little bit more checking and find out a little bit more about the family to, uh, to reassure myself that I actually have the right person. Um, what information does a birth record like this give? Well, obviously it gives you the date of birth. It gives you where the family lived. Um, the, the, the fa father's residence was Montpellier. The child was born there. This is where, this is where their home, he was a farmer. So he, he farmed probably outside the village um, in the townland of um, Montpellier. Um, and we know that, that William was a farmer. So we should be able to find this family in land records. We should be able to find um, what kind of farm he had, how, who, whose tenant he was, um, how long had they been in that area, all that sort of thing. Land records are very extensive and they're a logical extension from finding um, civil record, a civil record. We all, we both, we also know the name of the couple. We know his wife's name was Fanny, uh, and she'd been Fanny Talbot or Francis Talbot before they married. So we can find the marriage of the parents. And marriage records give a little bit more information. So we should be able to get back a bit further. So if we go, if we look for Talbot Goggin, it's the marriage is going to take place in 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 Fanny in Fanny's parish probably. Um, but Fanny, but, but Talbot and Goggin are not particularly um, common names. Uh, so the likelihood is we'll be able to, to do a search and find um, this marriage in or around, prob and probably it took place after the introduction of civil registration, unless Jane happens to be uh, the youngest of quite a large uh, family, which is possible because sometimes people had families over 20 years, and in which case they might have married. Uh, before the introduction of civil registration, and we have to go down another road. But and as it happens, we're lucky. They, it, uh, Jane was in fact their eldest child. They married the previous year in August of 1878. We see William Goggin married Fanny Talbot in um, Kilmastulla uh, Parish in County Tipperary, which is in the Registrar's District of Mina, which again is near to the Limerick um, side of Tipperary. And marriage records do give us a bit more information than we get in a birth record. Um, so we'll find out more about the family. We see that William and, and Fanny were both over 21, which will help us to, when we go to look for their birth, it narrows down a little bit. Uh, it was the first marriage for both of them. Um, William was a farmer, as we know, but he was, he was a, and he was a farmer the year before, not surprisingly. And now we see the explanation um, he was, his address is Mont, 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 Montpellier, um, the parish of O'Brien's Bridge, County Clare. So whatever the Ordnance Survey might say, William regards himself as a citizen of County Clare. Possibly he owned land in, uh, in County Clare, as farmers often owned parcels of land, um, and maybe the bulk of his land was in, 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 in County Clare. Maybe he lived in the village and he had held land in, in, um, in, beyond that. Uh, and maybe most of it was in County Clare. That's a possible explanation. But anyway, it helps us to identify this as the correct correct record because he 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 gives his address and writes it down as County Clare. Um, also gives us the name of his father was Edward, and Edward was also a farmer, which is very helpful because it means we be able to go back a little bit further into land records to uh, an Edward Goggin in this area we may be able to identify a bit more. Um, we also have um, Fanny's um, family. 
Uh, she came from Beachfield House uh, in Tilmasdula uh, in um, Tipperary, near, somewhere near Nina, and her father was George, and he was also a farmer. So again, we'll have land, land records for that. Uh, we're told that they were married in the parish church by the rites and ceremonies of the Church of Ireland, so that we know when we go to look for baptism records for the children, we know it to, to look in the, the registers of the Church of Ireland, which will be in probably, um, if they haven't been lost, um, they, they will probably be in the representative church body library and you will be able to see the actual registers, which is always nice when you would be in normal times. Um, we can also record the witnesses, which because witnesses were often relatives or they were, you know, it, it can be useful in narrowing down and for learning a bit more about, about somebody's life. So marriage records are very good. They give you a, quite a lot of information um, and particularly because they take you back another generation. Um, which is what you you always look to do when you're when you're researching. You want to go back from uh, one generation to the previous. Uh, and here we have the name uh, of um, of William's father. So that that enables you to look back a little bit further. Just before we finish, we look at a death record. Which Irish death records give very very little information compared with Scottish records, which are very detailed. Um, Irish records give very little, but they still give us some. And this is William's death many, well, quite some years later. In 1912, on the 3rd of December, he died at, at home in, Mont in Montpellier. Um, and we know from this record, we know that he was married. So his wife is still living and lives on. Uh, so we can look later for, for, for her death. Um, that uh, it was, his death was registered by Mildred Gog and his daughter. So that gives us the name of another one of his children, which is helpful. It's building up a little bit more about the family. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, that he had, he, he, he was a, a, still a farmer. He remained in the same place, which is quite likely, but also we know that he pro probably was a farm that had been there and been in the family for some time. Um, and um, it, it, so it, is, it, it gives a little bit more information about the family. He died in 1912, so we should be able to find him in both senses that are complete sets of records, the 1901 and the 1911. Um, so that from just those three records, we have quite a definite picture uh, of this particular family. We know um, that uh, the family that Jane uh, was born into, where they were farmers, seemed to be reasonably stable farmers. So they probably had a little a bit of land. Um, uh, they they had farmed in the same place for some time. Um, they had, an, had it, it looks as if they had a number uh, of children and we have got some leads into a number of other records. We can go and look at land records. We can look at church records. Um, we could uh, we could probably, in the case of William, we could look for a will because if he, if he had a, a farm and a leased farm, then he, he, would, he would have somebody to leave it to um, and so on. So that from the, the small sketch that we've got from for, of this family from the civil records, we can branch it out into a bigger, more colorful picture from the records that it leads us to. Um, and that's really what civil records are all about. They give us um, a wonderful framework uh, to build um, the rest of the story. So I hope I've given you some idea of the um, value the, and the resources in civil records and also some of their limitations. Um, and uh, we'll, 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 we'll help you to, um, to build from that framework. So thank you very much for listening. And if there are any questions, um, I think we can do that now. Um, thank you very, very much for that, Sandy. If I could just ask you to stop sharing your screen there, please. There we so, go. Super stuff. Thank you very much. Um, right. Well, unsurprisingly, it's been a very busy uh, Q&A box during the, the talk. Um, we've had a tremendous uh, attendance here tonight, which is uh, which is brilliant um, and is certainly a reflection on just how interesting uh, people find civil registration and how central as it is, it is as you say, to um, to beginning any any investigation of, of your family tree. I thought it was interesting you saying there 
given the uh, centrality of funerals in Irish life and in Irish society, it's interesting you say that uh, death certificates have quite scant information in comparison to their Scottish counterparts. Uh, I thought perhaps, uh, you know, you could be forgiven for thinking perhaps that um, there would be plenty of information in Irish death certs. So it's it, it's interesting. Uh, it's to, a curious to, one. We don't, don't, I mean, the, the, the Scottish records will even give you the time of death. Um, where um, we, we give very little right. information. I think we're I think we're probably our focus is probably more on the wake. You know, we're, we have, we're sensible people. Okay, okay. Well, look, I'm going to take a couple of questions. We've got a lot in the Q and A box, and I'm just conscious of of time and the fact that uh, you are probably feeling a little bit tired. Um, so a question here: uh, When a family member is connected to an estate for example, a, a servant or on the staff, where would you start to look for, for records in that specific situation? Um, work, workers on an estate or servants would be, if you're looking for, they would be, um, if I understand the, the question correctly, if they, they've been part of a, a particular estate of uh, the workers, then the records would be for that, for the area, whatever area the estate, wherever, wherever the estate is located, you would look for um, civil records in that um, uh, civil registration, uh, superintendent registrar's district or in that area of civil registration. Um, servants did move. Um, and they can be some of the hardest to, to keep to, to keep track of uh, in that in that respect. And you know, sometimes even if you lose them in, in Irish civil records, sometimes they turn up in, in, in UK records because it did happen that that, 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 that people that people moved. I've had that just recently, so it's upward in my mind. Um, but uh, no, it would be the area local to the estate or of of of, of uh, the, the house. Um, a question here uh, regarding registration of births. If a woman goes away from home, e.g., to her mother's to give birth, would the baby or the child be registered in that county? This person is saying, I have a relative living in Nina, went to her mother's in Ross Gray to give birth. Do I look for that birth in Ross Gray, for example? Um, as, as with many things in um, Irish family history, you would need to look in both um, okay. because it could, it, it the uh, you you were meant to give notice of a birth within three weeks uh, and uh, and full details within um, three months. It should be registered in the place where you were living and where which what what was your home. Um, but it would be wise to check in both. To check both. Okay, fair enough. Um, what impact, if any, did the custom house fire have a uh, on the on the records? Not on civil records. It did impact the um, church registers, the church, re the church of Ireland registers, which were public records in the sense that the Church of Ireland was the established church. Um, many, many were destroyed. Um, some, there are fragments and some are being hopefully restored. But uh, um, th that was the, that from this point of view of, of, of births and uh, uh, marriages and so on, they were, that was the big loss. Okay. Um, I recently found the grave of my great great grandfather, a Catholic, buried in a Protestant graveyard in Old Lachlan in Carlow. Was burying Catholics in Protestant churches common? Yes. Um, the, okay. uh, the, the, the Church of Ireland, up to 1870, the Church of Ireland was the established church in Ireland, and they had a duty and responsibility to, 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 to provide for the burial. Uh, of uh, people, you know, and also they own the land. Um, so yes, you do find you find Catholics buried in Church of Ireland cemeteries and graveyards and church and, and, and such such cemeteries. All that that is is quite common. Um, so I'm just looking here. Plenty of a uh, points. P people thanking you, uh, of course, you. Uh, for an absolutely terrific a presentation and um, what about a uh, Northern Ireland records before 1921 are they in Belfast or Dublin the um they are in available they are available in Dublin sorry that's something I should have said um well done actually and thank you for bringing that up because it's something I should have said um 
on uh, Irish genealogy and in the GRO in Dublin up to 1921, it, it's for the 30, you have the 32 counties. Um, after that, uh, the records are in um, the General uh, Registers Office of Northern Ireland or in the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland. Um, just a point here, a, in relation to two of the three online resources mentioned, Irish Genealogy and the LDS. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to read this out verbatim. If I understood mm -hmm. Sandy correctly, there is some degree of variation between them in terms of content. From Sandy's description of Irish roots, I can understand why its content would differ from the other two. But does Sandy have any sense of why there might be variation between the records on Irish genealogy and the LDS resources? Um, they cover different periods of time, uh, first, of, first of all. Um, uh, and um, when you're talking about, sorry, when you're talking about images, they cover different periods of time. Um, they also, um, the LDS goes to um, 1958, um, and, and that's, the, that's the cutoff point. Um, they're working with the same source material. Every, when we're looking at these records, we're not, we're looking at scanned images of the records and the scanning process, there is always uh, an element of error so that if you have two, um, um, two, database, two databases, you, you'll, you know, you, you can compare, um, you can compare the two. Also, the search engines are different. Um, and in a way, it, family search is a little bit more flexible in the way you can search it. So for that reason, they can complement each other. If I'm okay. saying it properly there. Um, now, I'd say if, perhaps if you have maybe one or two short sentences in relation to this, Sandy, um, mm -hmm. records for non-Christians, particularly marriages, and how or where they're recorded. So perhaps maybe I know you referred to Jewish. Um, um, they will. Um, they will. Be in, they will be in civil records if the if the marriage took place after eighteen uh, after eighteen sixty four. Um, they they will they will they'll be the civil register is the same across the denominations. Um, the actual mechanism may be may be may be slightly different um, with with some of the uh, small church communities. It would be the registrar who would register the marriage rather than the 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 the, the, the clergy. Um, but it that's uh, and, and that actually applies to quite a small number uh, of of people. But the records would be the same. Um, it, the civil records would, would would be the same. Before the introduction of the pension, what practical use did the civil records have for citizens? Did people have copies of their certificates at home? Did any other authorities, such as the police, have access to, to these records? They were, um, it was, um, as I said, it was a sort of growing move of um, organizing uh, society and developing a more formal relationship between uh, the citizen and the state. It was it part, part one of the, one of the big reasons for um, the, or one of the big needs for, for civil registration was a different kind of employment, and um, it, because people weren't really before that before that the the mid nineteenth century people weren't really conscious of their date of birth. It wasn't something they were ever asked for. It wasn't something that was ever required of them. Um, but as people were employed in an urban situation or in workforces, as opposed to being employed on the land or employed in, a, in a, um, an artisan situation, um, where they were employed, but where it was an apprenticeship or it was working for, for, for one person, um, as, there, as there was a work, they, there needed to be a more official recognition. There were also beginning to be concerns about the uh, child labor, about the age of. of that people should go into the workforce about the age of marriage, about all these sort of things. So things like a date of birth were beginning to be required. May, a lot of it was in employment. Um, and that was, was sort of how, that was how it began. And um, later it became a part of education because education applied to a certain age group um, and so on as, as things just became more official, more streamlined. If a person was born out of wedlock, um, how would this affect 
the registration of the birth or would it? Usually, usually it would be registered registered under the mother's name. It would be the mother's, even um, you know, unless the couple were married, it would be registered with the mother's name. You know, if they if they married very quickly around the time of birth, as often happened, there were very sort of uh, rapid marriages. Um, there's somebody wants to know when will the 1864 to 1870 deaths come online they but... should have been online this year but uh, you know, with after the year we've had uh, it, to be quite honest with you it, it's anyone's guess fair enough um, yeah. and I'm sure, I'm, it, it will it is happening yes it is happening but it, everything has been slowed down over the past year of course, of course. Um, now, this is more a, a, a speculative one, and maybe we might wind up then because you have, um, you know, you've uh, very kindly answered quite a few already. I can find a person married in 1907 with three children in quick succession, but no record in the 1911 census. Why, why might this be? You can't, you, they, they, were, they were married here and, and had three children, and then you can't find them in the 1911 census. They, um, Two, thing, two, two of the things immediately occur. Uh, try a number of different searches of the 1911 census. You know, if you're not getting it under their name, try searching by the place you think they lived. You know, by going, going in, going in, into browsing the census in that particular area. Um, they may have left. They may, they may have, have, have left. The, you know, they may have gone to the UK or further afield. Um, it's, it's quite possible. Um, uh, the, the first thing, though, is to exclude the fact that you've just missed them in the census, just because names in the census, uh, the, the online census, which is what we're all using at the moment, are very unreliable. So try a few name variations, try uh, searching by place, um, you know, exhaust everything then before you start looking on uh, Ancestry or something, for them, start looking for them outside Ireland. Fair enough. <laughs> Well, Sandy, on behalf of the audience and the National Archives, I'd like to thank you very much again uh, for your fascinating talk. I'd also like to thank you, our audience, uh, for tuning in to this evening's talk and for engaging with this topic in, in, in such a lively, uh, a lively and active manner. Um, our next online public talk will take place in late April. So please do keep an eye out on our Twitter account for further information and booking details. All will be revealed soon, hopefully. Um, and in the meantime, thank you very much again for joining us and wishing you all a very enjoyable evening. Good night and thank you. Good night. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.